Walter Payton, professional running back. Some say the best who ever played. But this man is more than just an extraordinary athlete. He is also a success in life. Husband, father, friend, businessman, citizen. Walter Payton is a winner. Bears head coach Mike Ditka is a tough, candid man. He does not use superlatives lightly. Uh, Walter Payton's more than a great athlete to me. I think that uh, everybody will recognize him for his great athletic talents and the records he set, but I, I like to look at him as a person who has given so much to the youth of our country by his example as a football player on and off the field. To me, that's what's really important. Uh, I've always made one statement about Walter. I don't think he takes any more than he gives, and I think that's the, uh, that's the true measure of a person in life. That generally is how most everyone talks about Payton. Praise admiration. Add it all up and you get a sincere but slightly homogenized portrait of an American hero. But that's not the real Walter Payton. That's just the image. The real Payton is even more surprising and exciting and full of life than that wondrous athlete inside jersey number 34. Take, for example, a magnificent day for Payton. Soldier Field, Chicago, October 7, 1984. The stage is set for a new career, NFL rushing record. Second play of the second half of the 21-yard line. Walter needs two to break the record. High formation, quick pitch to Walter, looking for the record, cuts back, he's got it, he's out of it at 25 to the 26-yard line. Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher, surpassing Jim Brown. And that's the equivalent to Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. And listen to the standing ovation. One might think that Peyton would savor this day of triumph. But as interviewer John Calloway discovered, Walter can be unpredictable. Would you recall for us just a couple of three moments in your football career? Can you paint a picture for us of the day you broke Jim Brown's running record? Well, you know, it really doesn't stand out. You know, I, it, it's one of those things to, to chase dreams, to chase uh, goals, because the mind that you have and the hope and the brilliance of color that you could paint just by thinking and striding forward. Once it happens, you know, it tends to lose some of the glimmer. Some can, of the you remember, can you remember the, the game? I try and, not to. And the play? I honestly try not to. It's something that, uh, that's happened. It was something that, the things that, that, that stand out to the most to me in my life are the small things. And Such as? Seeing uh, my first child smile at me seeing him take his first step. You know, the friendship that I developed between me and my teammates, the laughter that we have. You know, these things stand out more. They mean more than, you know, the actual activity on the football field. And, you know, when you try to think back, it's, it's sort of like a chore. It's kind of hard to, to go back and think of the things that, that you've done, you know, because I'm, I've never been one to, uh, to blow my own horn. And when I do think back, always think about something that somebody else did or something that somebody said to me that meant more to me than anything. This level-headed, mature approach is typical of Peyton. He sees himself as a businessman who happens to play football. He believes strongly in charting a course, making a plan. Do you have to do more planning now than you did in the past? I do basically the same amount of planning. My, my whole football career was planned out. It was? Yeah. Well, uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit? In other words, when I started out, I knew where I wanted to go, and I knew what I had to do to get there. And I looked at my progress as to where 
each year and each game. And I said, well, this is where I wanted to, I want to be in three years. This is where I want to be in six years. And that's the way I, I uh, approached it. I didn't approach it by looking, well, th this is where I want to be in 12 years. You can't, you, you can't say, well, in 12 years I want to be here because you have to deal with each thing at hand. So you break it down into portions that you can deal with as opposed to looking at the whole, whole uh, project. Peyton is also a goal-oriented businessman. He's doing well with sound investments. I'm not one of those guys to, uh, to sink a lot of money into uh, one thing, a uh, get-rich-quick deal, because life isn't made that way. And some carefully chosen endorsements. Winning. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of misconceptions about winning. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be on top, but just do the best that you possibly can. <laughs> when I was growing up, you know, Wheaties was that a thing that you associated with winners and champions. Peyton, and you say, well, I want to be able to eat Wheaties and be a champion. Peyton's attorney and financial advisor, Jerry Richmond. It should be noted that a uh, great many athletes are really poor business people. They really don't have the ability to understand deals, get into deals, and really make the decision as to what makes sense from them. And I got to tell you, Walter is, is really the exception to the rule. He's somebody who's got, first, I think, the business background to be able to judge a deal. And two, maybe more important than that, he's got a, a great gut reaction to whether a deal makes sense or doesn't make sense. But the real essence of Peyton is in the human relationships, family and friends. Connie and Walter Payton were married in 1976. They have a son, Jared, and a daughter, Brittany. Walter Payton is probably one of the most giving and most lovable and understanding husbands around. I was just told the other day that by a couple of girlfriends that they wish they would clone him, you know, <laughs> which he politely said, no, I don't think so. They only need one of me around here. I don't think they can handle having, you know, two of me around. But that's because uh, um, he can never stop giving of himself. Who are your heroes? My father, my mother. One of Peyton's best friends on the Bears is his backfield running mate, Matt Suey. He's a tremendous person. He's the type of guy that you look at, if you got a problem, if something goes wrong, I know I could turn to him and he would help me out regardless of what it would take and the amount of money would would spend. He'd certainly be there in times of, of need, and he's certainly there when things are going very well. Incomparable athlete, business tycoon, solid citizen. Not bad for a boy who grew up in a small town in southern Mississippi. Could you talk about your childhood growing up in Columbia, Mississippi? Well, see, it was like, uh, believe it or not, Disney World, because it gave me that, uh, that opportunity to use my creative thinking, to imagine, to picture, and to, uh, to use that part of me and to develop that. Whereas in today's time, it, what's happening now leaves little for the imagination. In other words, everything is all laid out and you just more or less go through it uh, methodically. As whereas I, growing up back then, I had to use my imagination to make fun, to, to visualize an army of, uh, Spanish guys coming at me and I'm standing, you know, in the sands and I'm hiding and waiting until they get close and then I start shooting or whatever. You know, these type of things. And for me, it was, you know, I wouldn't trade them for anything. Did you consider yourself poor when you were a child? Not at all. I feel, you know, people, like as outsiders looking in would have said I was poor. But for me, uh, the situation that I was in and with the love that I had and being able at that time to, to visualize myself doing great things, it, uh, it wasn't a, a matter of being poor because it, didn't, it really didn't take much to, uh, to satisfy us or to, uh, to keep us content. Peter Payton worked hard and took care of his wife and three children. Well, my, uh, my dad, he was, he was a guy who uh, he was very easygoing. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't upset him unless it was very serious. He would just, enjoy, you know, take his time and figure it out and talk to you. 
But if it was something that uh, that you were doing against somebody else, he always said that it was dangerous or whatever. Then he would come in and he would sit us down, sit me down, talk. And then after he got through talking, he would uh, put his discipline to me. Which was? He would spank me. With his hand? Sometimes. And sometimes? And with his belt. How did you respond? How did you feel about that? How did I feel about it? At that particular time, you know, I, uh, I couldn't deal with it. I didn't understand it. You know, I hated it, you know, just like any other kid. But now I'm glad he did. How about your mother? Is she tough? Mm. Oh, she gets that. She talks to you, and she makes you feel so bad that uh, you want to go spank your own self. <laughs> how, how did you get started in football? Just like any other kid, you know, playing in the uh, playgrounds, pick up football, touch football, playing with, uh, with cans that are wrapped with tape or playing with a stick or something just to get, uh, get a feel and be out there and exercising. I really didn't start getting into organized football until uh, going into the 10th grade. Why not? Well, I, uh, I had these, these dreams of being a professional drummer, and uh, I was in the band ever since the uh, fifth grade. So what happened? I mean, how did you resolve your desire to be a drummer and then to get into football? Well, you know, the friendships that you build while you're uh, involved in an organization, you become closer to people. and. Uh, it was, guess, a little bit of peer pressure because most of the guys that I was in the band with, they decided, well, let's try out for football. And it was sort of like a ripple effect. I started going with them. And from then on, uh, a lot of those, they went back to the band, but I eventually stayed in football. Peyton's high school football career was sensational. He remembers the first long touchdown run he had, not for the accomplishment as much as for what it taught him. Well, it, uh, it gave me, uh, you know, that uh, hypothetically pat on the back to say, you can do it and uh, get yourself going to work harder. But, you know, sometimes you have to get uh, a little dirt in the face to realize what's good for you or how to deal with another situation. By scoring a touchdown and doing that and making it and scoring it the way I did, Sometimes you tend to walk around like a, a barnyard rooster with your chest out a lot of times. And it takes a slap in the face to bring you back to reality and to realize that the reason that you made it was because the commitment and the dedication and the hard work that you put into it. And if you don't continue to work at it and to build on it, it's not going to be there. And that was one of the things that taught me at the end of that first year. He also became a good student. He got a challenge and his competitive nature took over. I had a teacher tell me, say, well, you're never going to make it through college. Say, so you better get you a good job now. And uh, that was like a motivator for me. It was like something that stuck. That was what I was looking for to get me going, because the other things didn't work. And in three and a half years, I'd gotten my, uh, my diploma from college and with a B minus average. So it just takes time. When it came time to choose a college, Peyton pulled a surprise and chose relatively small, predominantly black Jackson State, 80 miles up the road from his hometown. Why? Well, I had about 64 different offers in basketball, baseball, track, and football. And uh, the reason that I went to Jackson State was because something that my mom told me a long time ago. And after uh, my uh, junior year in uh, high school, she uh, kind of brought it into focus for me. She said, if an individual or person tries to buy your talents, then they think very little of you as a person and more of you as a product. Once that product ceases to produce, then that individual has no more need for it. He goes out and buys another one. Peyton established himself as an incredible athlete at Jackson State. In four seasons, he scored 66 touchdowns. He also kicked 63 extra points and five field goals. But he's never been one to dwell on records and numbers. Well, what are statistics? You know, if you start believing in, and reading what, uh, what you've done or looking back at what you've done, you're never going forward. And then a lot of times if you do that, you become content with what you've done. 
and then you, you feel, well, well, that's it. But there's a lot more, and uh, you just can't get caught up in that, in numbers, because numbers are not the thing that makes you go out and work uh, three hours or work until you can't walk. Numbers are not, it's not that. It's a feeling inside. It's a desire that you have to uh, fulfill, and numbers have nothing to do with it. Did college begin to be a, a, uh, an experience for you? We, when we see you now, our, our picture of you is of total determination and desire. Have you always had that, or did that begin to emerge in college? Well, I've always had it. I've always wanted to, uh, whenever I got involved in something, I wanted to give it all I had. After his career at Jackson State, it was clear that professional football was next. The Chicago Bears made him their first draft choice in 1975. During his early years with the Bears, Peyton was a superlative player on an ordinary team. But how could an athlete with such relentless dedication accept the losses that came more frequently than the victories? For Walter, it was all in the mind. What percentage of this game is, uh, is physical and, and what part of it is mental? Can you differentiate it? Yes, it's easy. About uh, 85 percent is mental. Really? Yes. It's preparation. Being able to, uh, to deal with, uh, with losses, to get yourself mentally ready to go back for another week. Because everything, when you play professional football, everything is based upon winning. And if you don't win, in other words, you work all week for a, for a game plan, you work on it and then you go into the game it doesn't work and you lose then you have to get yourself mentally ready real fast to start the next week how do you do that well you what you have to do is you have to to say I'm running a mile I'm running uh, 10 miles and every time that I complete one mile I can't think about I've just completed one mile I got to think about I'm just starting because if you start thinking about, well, I've ran two miles, I ran three miles, then you start to get tired, mentally and physically tired. So that's the same approach you use to football, because every week, it's a mile. It seemed that each week, Peyton would take a beating, but he would always come back for more. He has a somewhat mystical approach to pain. You don't, when you have pain, what you do is you focus on non-pain, your mind focus on, on soothing what's hurting. Your mind focus on creating a, a healing form. In other words, I've had injuries that for some people, it would have taken them three, maybe four weeks. I've had injuries that, that have taken three, four days. And what other reasons can you uh, apply to that? You can't say it's medicine because a lot of times I don't take medicine. It's, it, it's a reasoning that I use. It's that there are certain things that I dwell upon, like thinking, positive, like it's going to be okay, it's going to be well, it's getting well, it's feeling better. And it happens. And the only other, only other way to explain it is that if you look at the brain, the percentage of, of the brain that we use, the percentage that we don't use, maybe I've some way tapped over into that, into utilizing, to building, making the body produce its own enzymes for healing. Because we, we can do that. In a small way, we, we know that certain things happen, chemistry in our bodies that, that happens, that produces healing enzymes. But if we take it a little bit farther than that, to utilize that brain that we're, uh, we're carrying around on the top of our heads, to utilize all of it, to produce, to end pain, to, to numb pain, to speed healing, and it happens. Fame and wealth came suddenly to this young man from the rural South, but there were no great changes in him. His off-the-field life was stable, traditional, while at Jackson State, he met Connie. His coach, Robert Hill, had arranged the first date. He wanted Walter to meet a nice girl who would have a good influence on him. 
They married after his first season with the Bears. Walter, you've been quoted as saying that you were totally happy with yourself when you married Connie, and you said this was the first time you felt that way about yourself. Mm -hmm. Did you really say that, and if you did, why did you say it? What was going on? Well, when you say you're totally happy with yourself, in other words, you're, uh, you've, you've gotten on the right track to a lot of things that you're, uh, you're shooting for, that you want to accomplish, some goals that you've set for yourself, and you have the right uh, formula for getting there. You have the right uh, perspective. You have the right attitude. You have basically a feeling inside of you that this is it. This is the right time. And that's the way I felt my second year. Connie had married a man. She ended up with a legend. After uh, Walter's third year with the Chicago Bears, it became apparent to me that I wasn't just married to any, you know, football player. Walter's, I guess, from his very first year, started setting all these high goals for himself and things that he wanted to accomplish. And believe me, they were all coming true. You know, um, you know, he knew someday he wanted to um, surpass O.J. Simpson's Russian rec record and. Um, um, you know, be the Bears' leading rusher, and all of these things started to, to become real. His view of marriage is mainstream, unselfish Peyton philosophy. Well, it's, it's a, marriage is, a, is an institution, and it, when you start out, if you don't start out with the basics, then obviously you're not going to make it through it. And the basics are? Knowing that you have to give more than you receive, and give more than you want to receive on both sides. That way you have no problems. As a father, I, th I think Walter is wonderful. Even though he's gone, and I don't think he's gone as much as some people, you know, think he's gone. When he's home, he spends a lot of time with the kids, a lot of quality time, and I think that's what's important. And even when he's gone, he must call us three or five times a day to find out what we're doing and what's going on. So I, I think he is a wonderful dad. And to watch him, you know, outside with my son playing or in the house with Brittany, throwing her up in the air, you know, which, which she loves, it's, it's very nice. A football expert once said, when God decided to make a perfect halfback, he chiseled out Walter Payton. A lot of people might agree with that, and it's certainly flattering but it doesn't capture the complete portrait of number 34. There is more to him than raw physical ability. When you see him at his best, he's expressing his life. When you watch films of yourself in action, do you ever wonder how number 34 pulled off a particular run? What do you think when you watch yourself do those impossible runs? <clears throat> a lot of them are, are runs that you, you you really have no uh, definition or how to define what happened. It just happened. I think it's basically timing and being in the right position. But to get yourself in the right position, it goes, th those plays started a long time ago. Those moves that not, they just didn't happen there. Those things have happened when I was five years old, when I was eight years old, when I was. 15 and on up. You know, it's something that's been a part of me, but you never get a chance to actually use them in battle until, you know, you get there. And you don't know what you're doing, you're just doing it. And a lot of it, because you're, you've done it before, doesn't mean that you can do it again until that, that right moment, that right setting, and that right timing is there. And then it comes back again. Another important element in the complete patent is being prepared to do your best over the long haul. It is just unheard of in pro football to go through 11 punishing years without injury, never missing a game. Peyton's conditioning regimen astounds people, and he keeps increasing his fitness program as he gets older. There's a steep hill near his home. It has become an obsession with him. The hill is probably... Uh... You know, there are places around the country where you have the, uh, the widow maker and all this other stuff. But the hill is something that, that uh, if you had to give it a name or a description, it would probably be either a goal setter 
or will maker. Because once you start working out on it, you set a goal. First, when you first start out on it. What's it made out of? It's made out of black dirt. You go out and... It's, it's already there. It's about uh, uh, 60, between 50 and 60 yards long. And it's at an angle where if you got halfway to the top and you tried to stop, you would probably end up slipping down. But it's what it is. Once you go there and you run it the first time, it, uh, it humbles you to the, to the extent that the next time you go there, you, you got to beat it. You got to set it. So if you did five the first time, you go back, and your goal is to do six or seven, to keep going, to always beat it. And see, you find yourself going to a point where it's no win for you. Because every time that you, you reach one goal, you have to set another goal for you. Would you talk about how you go about conditioning yourself in the off season? What do you do to stay in shape? I could explain it in one word, but then you would, I know what you're going to ask me, then you're going to ask me to explain it more. What I try to do is I try to kill myself. What do you mean? I work, work myself out to the extent where I, when I'm through, I can't walk. Or I'm so tired that it takes me 15 to 20 minutes to get myself ready or to get myself back together before I could leave the place where I'm working out. What kind of man is this? A perfectionist at work. A loving husband and father, literally revered by his peers. No one is that perfect. No one is free of negatives and weaknesses. Walter has them. He just tries to work around them. For one thing, his life is public, and he loves privacy. Many of us also, who are in business or struggling with professions and having down times, we're always running, running, rushing, rushing around, and so on and so forth. Have you found it's important to have some privacy? You got and to, to have a chance to be alone and to think and to feel and to meditate? You have to. You have to be able to divorce yourself of a lot of the, uh, the things that go, go on around you. Because if you don't, then you're going to get caught up in it. And then the things that it got you there, the things that it brought you there, the things that mean the most to you, you're going to neglect. And when you do that, where are you? Basically shy and modest, Peyton is sometimes uncomfortable dealing with the media. I particularly don't like it, don't like talking to him, but I have to because it goes along with the job. He talks about what he sees as faults in himself. Probably not having uh, the patience at some things that, uh, that I should have. Probably for, uh, for keeping a lot of things inside of me trying to work them out myself before I uh, relate them to other people. And I also, one of the things that I cannot deal with is my temper when I find out that someone is misusing someone else or taking advantage of someone else. How do you deal with anger? How do I deal with it? It depends on what the uh, confrontation is. If, I, if I'm angry with someone or somebody for doing something wrong or not doing something, then I walk away. Because I would rather apologize for not saying anything as opposed to apologizing for something I said that I really didn't want to say. He seems to have the strength to rise above inequities. Did you encounter any racism when you were growing up? Not at all. You know, no more than, uh, than normal. D did you grow up uh, really without any sense of that? Did your parents not tell you about the blatant racism of Mississippi? Well, you could see it. And one of the things is that... Uh, when, when it's there and you, and you know it's there, you can deal with it. You know, it's, it's no problem. It's sort of like looking at a, at a, like a pothole in the street. If you know it's there, you can avoid it. But if he doesn't, you don't know if it's there, you're going to run into it. And that was one of the things that, uh, that my parents, they taught. And uh, one of the things that, that I can tell with now, like in, in the big cities, you can't tell when, when somebody doesn't like you because they, they, use, they use people, and you, you could think that they're your friend, and then all of a sudden they can't stand you. But in Mississippi, when I was growing up, it was different. If someone didn't like you, you knew it. And that was it. You've, you have painted a picture of great self-reliance and self-responsibility. But do you ever get to the point in life where you have to say, Walter, I need help, and turn to somebody else? Oh, there are a lot of times that you're going to need help from the... Uh, but see, what, what it is, you're, you're constantly getting something from the people that you meet. 
you're getting a strength. You know, it's sort of like, uh, for instance, you're an uncharged battery, and you every time you meet somebody, you're charging yourself up by something good or whatever from them. And whenever I get to the point where it seems like I'm uh, I'm beyond or I'm getting too big or too emotionally involved in, in things to, to function right, all I do is, is I go back home, hang around mom for a while. She puts me right back into, put things right back into perspective for me. Because when I'm down there with her, it's not like I'm Walter Payton, the football player, I'm Walter Payton this. It's Walter Payton, take out the garbage, Walter Payton, do you eat your vegetables, Walter Payton, sit up right, you know. These are the types of things, you know, that slap in the face that brings you back to reality. You talk about the, um, the good that it does you to go home and see your mother in Columbia, Mississippi. Do you ever take your children? Yes. Is it good for them? Oh, definitely good for Jerry because mom puts him right back in his place, too. You've been described as a man of faith. Are you a man of faith? I believe that there's someone that's put, in this, that's put this all together that's very much higher, much stronger, more wiser than I am. Because if you look around and you see all these things that come together, man didn't do it alone. It's no way possible. It's got to be something else. But don't you have any sense of the tradition of the past faith that says that you must love your neighbor? Isn't that centerpiece to your faith? Yes. You, you love your neighbor. You love him because you love him or her because of what, who they are. How can you belt the heck out of your, your friend on the football field and be loving at the same time is the question many of us because, wonder about. Because when I play the game of football, I don't play it with malice in my heart. I play it because it's a game. It's a profession. The quintessential Peyton run ends with his signature. The final blast into a tackler and then a quick bounce up and canter back to the huddle as if nothing had happened. There are times when you get hit and you bounce back up then it, uh, it instills in the person's mind who tackles you or who's hitting you that, you know, maybe hit you with his best shot. Maybe you felt it, but then you didn't show it. Then he thinks, he said, wait a minute. I hit this guy with all I had, and this is, he gets up like that. And I never let anybody intimidate me because if they intimidate you, then you might as well not even play the game. What are you afraid of? According to Connie, there's only one thing in the world that frightens her husband. A lot of people see Walter as being a perfect man and not afraid of anything. But if you want to see him run or get scared, bring a needle and say, Walter, okay, you've got to take this shot or get some blood drawn. He is the biggest crybaby when it comes to taking shots. There is not much else in life that Peyton shies away from. Supreme running back, successful businessman, it all seems to stem from the vivid pictures he paints in his mind, an extension of his childhood imagination. And it's the same way. Once you start out in the business world, there are things that you want to accomplish. Everyone, when they open up a new business or start off, first thing they want to do, the first thing that comes in their mind is, it's not want to be a thousandaire, a hundredaire, they want to be a millionaire. And once you, uh, you earn that, that first million in whatever you're doing, it's something that you say, it's, it's sort of like painting the picture of earning that million in your mind means more to you than actually earning that million. Because after you earn that first million, then you have to use that imagination or that creativity inside of you to push you, to, to make you strive for more. Then you say, well, I earned the first million. What's, what's left for me? And with me, it's the same way. Passing, uh, going over 10,000 yards, going over, uh, passing Jim Brown, uh, scoring so many touchdowns or doing, you know, getting into the Super Bowl. You know, as I'm approaching these, these milestones, the, the picture that I paint in my head and the perfume and the, uh, the cherry blossoms and the incense that go along with it, you know, it's, you can't put it into words. But if I were to ask you to address a group of business people and to try to summarize 
aside from the business of, of good and bad, but to more specifically summarize uh, the things that you've learned that might apply to them as business people, what would you say to them? You have to surround yourself with people that are uh, adept in dealing with pressure, that are adept in dealing with uh, making decisions, and that are very confident and aware of what they do, and they do it very well. And they think they do it very well, or else they wouldn't be doing it. You should get that advice. Those people, the people that you trust, people that are working for you, that are very astute at what they do. What's your, what's your style of dealing with people when they work with you? you know, my style in dealing with people is to be myself, and to approach them with an open mind, to put myself in their position, to try to feel what they're feeling in their situation. And that's the key, being able to, uh, to transcend into someone else's being, their conscious thought. That way, if you know what it feels like to be in that position, then you'd know how you would want someone to react to you, and then you would know how to react to them. Peyton gives Bears head coach Mike Ditka a very high grade as a businessman. You got to be able to, to give your people, give the employees, give them a goal. Give them, because when Mike Dick came to the Bears, he gave us a goal. He was the first one that said, we're going to win a Super Bowl. No one else said it. Everyone else had, okay, we're going to get out here, we're going to play as hard as we can, and we're going to do some things, we're going to win some games, we're going we're gonna to be better. But nobody said, this is your goal, this is what you shoot for. Give them something to shoot for. And once they reach it, then let them know how you appreciate it. Ditka took over the Bears in 1982. Before that, he was an assistant coach for the Dallas Cowboys. It took him four years with the Bears to reach the Super Bowl. It took him far less than that for him to appreciate Peyton. Well, I think when I was an assistant coach in Dallas and, and watched him, you know, I really never understood uh, how great he really was. Uh, until I got to meet him in person and see him in person and see the things that he can do. I think you get a one-dimensional uh, idea of Walter when you see him from afar, and that's that he's a great running back. I think he's the most complete football player I've ever seen. He runs, he blocks, he passes, he can kick, he could do anything we have to do. He receives the ball. He could probably play one of uh, any one of maybe three or four positions, being receiver, running back, quarterback, and kicker. Peyton gets this same kind of respect from his teammates. But they also appreciate him for his sometimes devilish nature. His sense of humor is outrageous. Matt Suey can testify to that. Probably Walter's greatest gift is his ability to, to uh, have the element of the prank and the surprise. Uh, he's tremendous at that. And not only that he's a prankster, but he's a, he delivers a, the lines and the the ability to let the pressure off a person when things are going tough. I remember I had dropped the pass. I broke my thumb late in the preseason a couple years ago, and I dropped the touchdown pass in the end zone, and he walked up to me, and I was pretty dejected about it. I was upset about it, dropped a clear open pass for a touchdown. He said, listen, you can always join the Army or you can get a paper out, one of the two. And it really loosened up a little bit, and two plays later I scored a touchdown. So I, I enjoy his personality, and, and you've heard of pranks, and you've heard of firecrackers, and the ability to call uh, uh, guys who just got married on the team and pretend that he's a girl, his voice is very high, he disguises it very well, and, and the wives are going, geez, who's this guy? He did it Calvin Thomas and almost got Calvin, Calvin Thomas uh, divorced or killed. So he's a pretty much of a person that knows how to, to lay a pretty good prank on. Bears All-Pro Center Jay Hilgenberg talks about Peyton the athlete, who leads by example. Well, what Walter means to me is uh, you're playing actually with a legend, and just the determination he has out in the field and the way his work habits during the tough days out of practice that just really makes you appreciate what he has accomplished and um, as a player to try to duplicate his work habits they um, it can do nothing but help you in the long run when we were watching films last year Tampa Bay game I never forget the move uh, Walter put on Hugh Green. It was a sweep to left hand side. And it just it that's just told to Walter what he did there. He he made a cut back inside and turned it around outside, just completely left Hugh Green, who's now staying linebacker, just 
dead on his feet and couldn't move and Walter just walked it in it for a touchdown. Plays like that, you just sit back in an amazement and just, it's unbelievable that a guy after 10 or 11 years can still be making moves like that. And yet playing football must at times be almost a contradiction for Peyton. He is constantly preparing his mind and body to be perfect in an imperfect game. Mistakes, bad plays, penalties, strong opponents, these things get in his way. What goes through his mind when he fumbles? Well, you, what you do is, when you start out, it, 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 it doesn't start from that game or from that fumble. It starts a long time before that. In other words, when you're holding the ball, how you hold it, if you take pride in what you do. One of the things in being a complete football player is you, you catch the ball when it's thrown to you, you hold on to the ball when it's passed to you, when it's handed off to you, you block when you're told to, you run pass routes when you're told to. And this is being a complete football player. Fumbling is something that's going to happen because the ball isn't shaped with a handle on it, and the body contact isn't so that it's very meek a mile, it's very vigorous. And sometimes it's going to happen. If you get into the right position and the right, uh, right contact or whatever, you're going to lose the ball. You're going to be separated from it. You know, you accept those things. You know it goes along with the territory. If uh, it happens at a critical moment, what you do, you use it to, to build or to kindle that fire inside of you so that when you come out the next time, you're aware of it. You say, well, I'm not going to make the same mistake again. The, the, the key to any professional is not to make the same mistakes over and over again because you're not going to be able to play a mistake-free game. You're going to have problems. You're going to have mistakes. But if you keep making those same mistakes over and over and over again, then you can't classify yourself as a professional. In his 11th season with the Bears, Peyton finally got what he wanted, a world's championship. Normally, a star running back who had been around that long would be a symbolic figure, the old let's win this one for Walter story. But that's not the way it went. Walter was also winning it for them. The Bears won 17 games and lost one, and still furiously competitive, Peyton led the way. Soldier Field, Chicago, September 29th, 1985. The Bears romp over the Redskins. Trick play in the second quarter. McMahon takes, he hands it off to Peyton, rolling right, and he wants to throw. But Peyton stops, now spins back the other way to the left side. Pop flight, the end zone for McMahon! Yes! yes! Touchdown, Walter Payton and Jim McMahon! Later in October, the Bears were stomping on the Minnesota Vikings. McMahon returned the favor. Goes in motion to the left side, now turns back the other way. Here's the snap to McMahon, a third and eight. The rush is on, sets up a screen pass to Payton, right side, one-handed grab of the 25, oh, oh, oh. down the right side, 15, 10, Perry right, five, oh, oh. down! <laughs> the Bears really needed Walter in a rough game at Green Bay on November 3rd. And here's the handoff to Walter Payton. Breaks off right tackle. Look breaks out. the tackle to the 20. To the Look 15, out. to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown! Oh, the Bears went 12-0 when they beat the Atlanta Falcons at Soldier Field. The toss to Payton sweeping right. He's got some blocking. Makes the turn 40. 35-30, right sideline. 25-20. May go all the way. 15-10-5. Touchdown! But the resounding 46-10 Super Bowl victory over New England was not a showcase for Peyton. With the Patriots' defense stacked up to stop him, the Bears found other ways to score. There was speculation that Peyton was angry because he wasn't one of the big stars of the game. Was Super Bowl XX a tough moment for you? Not at all. It was, like I said, it's anticlimactic because I painted such a beautiful picture and the media also helped by doing that, that once the game started, if the game would have been a lot closer, I think it would have been it would have meant a lot more. It's sort of like it, it was too easy. And it wasn't supposed to be that easy. There was also criticism of Ditka for not allowing Peyton at least a token touchdown as the score kept getting higher. But long after the Super Bowl, Peyton's evaluation of Coach Ditka was strictly positive. Well, as a coach, he had the uh, the uh, knowledge of surrounding himself by people who were tops in their business. And to utilize 
their insight along with his to develop a mixture that he could feed to the players so that they would perform. And that's the key. You know, it's not you knowing everything or it's not somebody else knowing everything. It's being able to blend all these knowledges or these resources together into a melting pot so that everyone, once they come and once they smell and taste the aroma, they see that this is the one. Is he tough? He's not tough at all. He, 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 t he tries to be tough, but he isn't. What do you mean by that? I mean, is he a, so is he a softy underneath? You see, he's so soft, he tries to be tough so that he can hide a lot of that. And I think that's, that's good because a lot of times if he doesn't, he will be taken advantage of. It is clear that Peyton would rather talk about other people than himself. He remembers a special friend, a backfield running mate who retired in 1983 because of injuries. Could, do you have any stories about favorite moments in this game or things, pals, that you clowned around with that, that are sweet and dear to you? The only, uh, the only memory I have is uh, really stands out. It's a bad one. And that was the day that a friend of mine, Roland Harper, retired. Out of everything else that's happened, that's the only one that sends out the most. Tell me about that. Well, we started out together, and for nine years we played together. And when he had to retire, it was sort of like a part of me was gone. Did you keep together? Oh, yes. What's special about him? Why do you like him so much? Why? Because <clears throat> Roland, he had, uh, he had a hand in teaching me a lot of things about being unselfish and uh, giving of yourself. He was that way. You really need that when you come into this world, don't you, of professional football? You have to have it. One aspect of giving of yourself for Peyton is his strong interest and participation in helping young people. He is absolutely super when it comes to kids. Uh, I've always kidded him. Walter is this kid trapped in this 31-year-old body today. And sometimes he can't get out of the body, but the, the, but the soul and what the essence of Walter is, is he's just a kid. What do you have to say to the kid who's in the ghetto or who's in a bad way or who's being abused? What hope can you hold out for that child? The hope that if they believe in something and believe in themselves and not be led along by things that are happening around them or by individuals who come talking with smooth tongues and false promises and set goals for themselves to, to look at, at certain images or certain people and say, that's what I want to be. That's where I want to be when I'm, grow when I'm grown up or this is, where I wanna put, this is what I want to shoot for. And hold on to it because dreams are all that we have. Dreams are what make this whole country. This is what made this country was a dream. And if you believe in something and you work at it, then that's going to be a hope. That's going to be a way. Walter sees the entire life process as growth, if you pay attention along the way. You have to. You could learn something from everything. I mean, believe, you can get up in the morning and just venture out. And there are things that you've never seen because you've never been up that time before. Or there are some t things that you've never seen because the timing has been wrong. And to get up and to, to comprehend, to take in. A lot of people, they see it and they don't see it. It's just like, for instance, you're in a car and you're driving and you drive this, this route every day, you know, for a year. But then all of a sudden, you're not driving, you're sitting on the passenger side. You start to see things that you've never seen before and you've driven that road all, all that time. It's because you become so blinded by the pattern and the routine that you're not able to comprehend the beauty or the surroundings that, it, that are there until you are placed in a situation where you're not driving, you're not concentrating, you're just watching. Then these, these small things become a part of it. It took a long while to find something that Peyton would brag about. Certainly you have enough ego to brag a little bit about your prowess as a passer. Now can we talk? Now, can we you, talk more? No, no. If you, want to, if you want to get me to brag about something, it's about my basketball. I say, I can play some basketball. All right, give us 30 seconds of brag. Uh, well, you want, you want to talk about my jump shot? Do you have a nice fadeaway? Oh, Three-pointers, unbelievable. 
and I can take it to the hoop when I have to. My biggest goal was when I used to play one-on-one -on -one in my driveway against Artis Gilmore. Yep, and I beat him too. Now, is that brag enough? Ask Connie to brag about Walter, and you get a touching story. One of the best times I've ever had with Walter was about uh, three weeks ago on our 10th wedding anniversary. Walter and I never had a wedding. So for a surprise for our 10th anniversary, he flew um, not only my, my parents and his mother, but the minister that married us 10 years ago, um, the two guys from the football team who were our witnesses. He flew them both in, and I hadn't seen them since we left school. And a lot of our close friends from around, you know, here in Chicago. And we redid our wedding vows. And it was like the wedding we never had. And it was, it was really wonderful. He had it so well planned, and it was such a neat surprise. Perhaps the sum total of Walter Payton is how he wants to be remembered. As a person, that whenever he played the game of football, he left everything he had out there on the football field. He did everything he possibly could for the team to win, not for himself, but for the team to win. That's the only way you, that anyone could be remembered. Whatever they did, that whatever they did, they did it as best that they possibly could. That's all anyone would want out of life. And it's not being the best. It's not winning this or not holding this record. It's just that when you were out there, because for a record, a guy could come out for the first time, never played the game, and break a record or set a record. But what is that? That's a record. And, you know, he might not ever play it again. He holds a record. He's written up as it. But for people to say, when he was on the football field, he gave all he had. And then when he was off the football field, he was just that much of a person that you could relate to, you could talk to. He had feelings. You know, that's what you want to be remembered as. Because... Football is uh, it's a business. Walter Payton is a human being.